stress, basically from a biological machinery point of view, is that your body is responding to a threat. Simple as that, right? A, a tiger shows up in the classical caveman and women years, and so your body goes through a very predictable cycle, starts in your amygdala, ends up in your adrenal glands, and you get a jolt of uh, cortisol in your blood, okay? Cortisol is a very useful hormone in many, many, many ways, uh, but it's most famous for the idea that when your body detects cortisol, it literally, like a computer scientist, uh, reconfigures the machines. So, so your, your body becomes a very different machine, okay? In your typical day-to-day uh, -day life, your body has a balance of all functions. When it sees cortisol, it, um, it dilates your, your pupils so that you can see better. It sends more sugar to your brain so that you can think faster. Uh, it sends a lot of energy to your muscles so you can either beat the tiger or run away from it, right? And, and in doing that, it has to re-optimize re its use of resources, if you want. And so it shuts down your digestive system, it shuts down your kidneys, it shuts down your liver and everything that is unnecessary at the moment. You know, as Alice always explains it, she says, uh, you know, what's the point in digesting your steak if you're about to be a steak yourself, right? And, and so that is, in a very interesting way, that stress response is one of the most valuable machineries that we've ever been given. Believe it or not, without cortisol, humanity would have never survived, right? Simple as that, huh? The problem is, um, in the typical design of the machinery, <coughs> excuse me for using the word machine, but we are machines, there are two cycles to stress. There is one that gets you stressed, okay? Uh, cortisol in your blood, you get, uh, you know, super configuration, you fight or you run away. And then there is something that we call the feedback loop, where basically, believe it or not, most of the time your stress happens in your amygdala before you even recognize there is something attacking you, okay? So, you know, you find yourself popping out of your seat if someone opens the door, and that's not even rational, okay? Uh, but that jolt of cortisol lasts in your blood for 90 seconds, only 90 seconds, okay? And within those 90 seconds, you're given enough time to engage your prefrontal cortex so that you can actually look, look at what's happening and decide if there is a reason to be stressed or not, okay? And so, so theoretically, like you see in the animal kingdom, you're supposed to run from the tiger and then 90 seconds later, you stand somewhere near to the, to, the, to the river and eat some grass and chill, okay? We don't chill. Why? Because for most of the stress that we feel today, there's actually no tiger at all, okay? At least not physical tiger in front of you. You're thinking about the economic collapse that may happen in the United States in two and a half years and how that affects on currency uh, exchange rates and, you know, what the tariffs will do. And none of that makes any tiger. It's just all in the prefrontal cortex to start, right? And so because stress is, is initiated in your rational brain, very irrationally if you ask me, uh, it basically goes through the 90 second lease and then 90 seconds later your brain goes like, yep, yeah, the stress is still there. The, the reason to be stressed is still there. And so you get another jolt of cortisol, another jolt of cortisol. And some of us would actually remain stressed for a lifetime, 50 years, 40 years, some of us for weeks, some of us for months. And that happens on everything. It happens on the, the global macroeconomics. It also happens in your relationship with your loved one. It also happens at work with, you know, the legal team that's annoying you or whatever. Okay? And for all of them, in our current modern world, we, we view them as tigers. And as we view them as tigers, we deal with them as tigers. And because we, that view is generated inside our heads, we continue to see them as tigers. So we continue to feel stressed. So this is the biology. I, I told Alice I was going to look at the mathematics of stress. And the mathematics is very straightforward. Uh, you can see it all over physics. If you've studied physics to fourth grade or whatever, 
stress was stress in objects. So if I wanted to stress this bottle, I put it on the floor and pre press it, the stress is not the, related only to the amount of force applied to the bottle. It's the amount of force divided by the cross-section area of the, of the bottle. Do you remember that? Right? So your, the stress is force divided by resources to carry the force. Okay? And in, you know, as soon as, I, as you see this, you understand that this applies identically to humans. Okay? Uh, why? Because Issues that stressed me when I was in my 20s, I freaked out about them. By 30, I was freaking out, but I managed to deal with them. By 40, I dealt with them with ease. In my 50s, I laugh about them, right? Not because they're any easier, but because I increased my square footage, my resources, okay? So in, hum in humans, your stress is not just the challenges applied to you externally. It's the challenges applied to you divided by your skills, your resources, your connections, <coughs> whatever it is that you have to be able to deal with the stress, okay? And that suddenly makes life quite interesting. Why? Because believe it or not, the forces applied to you, quite a few of them are within your control because they happen in your head, not in the real world, okay? And your square area, the resources that you have to deal with the situation, are still within your capability because you can always invest in yourself and develop and grow, right? Which makes, I know this sounds annoying, but it makes feeling stressed a choice, okay? And if it's a choice, then we can manage it despite the external forces.